we are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have reached the appointed hour here. We're uh, logging in our uh, folks that are joining us virtually, and uh, I'm going to do the same over here so that I can monitor and make sure we're giving uh, full attention to our members that are joining us virtually. Uh, while I'm doing that, I, I will go ahead and, and use this uh, to, uh, opportunity to call our meeting together, the House Higher Education Committee. Um, thank everyone for attending. We have two items on the agenda that this afternoon they're going to both be hearing only. That's going to be the posture of the chair this year. We're going to try to hear a, a bill, um, you know, once, and then we'll, we'll action the second time, uh, it, you know, unless we get to a very tight spot at the end of the session and we have, uh, uh, you know, complete uh knowledge and agreement on the measure it just gives the members uh time to ingest it and make sure we get it right uh chairman smith at rules has been very clear he wants us to you know send uh good clean uh well vetted legislation so we're going to attempt to do that bear with me um still getting used to the two second video and sound delay it's very disconcerting um but i think we're we're here now Okay, um, we call the roll last time. If if there's not objection, I see Scott Holcom and Betsy, rep, excuse me, Representative Holcom, uh, Representative uh, Holland online. That's the only two members I see. Ms. George, is that correct? And then you have you can get the attendance of the room here, and we do have a quorum with those online. So at, at this time, uh, we'll move forward and. Uh, uh, into our agenda this afternoon, House Bill 152, um, if you'll get prepared for us. Um, that's going to be LC 490370S. 490370S. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as he stated, it's LC 4903. 70S. Um, this is, uh, for those of you that were on the committee last year, uh, this measure was brought before you last year. It's a department bill for the non-public post-secondary education commission. Uh, Director Kirk is, uh, Shook is with us today. He'll answer any questions you guys might have. Um, but just to run through it really quickly, uh, there was one change from last year, which we'll start with. <clears throat> In an effort of saving the department money, there are these schools that are also located on military bases in the state of Georgia. Um, he's got some data on exactly the numbers and what have you, but basically in an effort of uh, saving the department some money, those schools are actually already monitored by federal regulations because they're on the military bases. So they basically would come out from underneath the umbrella of his uh, regulation. That's section one. Um, section two is just a cleanup from previous code that had some mis- uh, some numbers that were mislabeled, uh, just cleans that up. Uh, number three, section three, just gives the director actually authority that he did not have to be able to uh, more efficiently uh, and effectively run the department. And number four, if you recall last year, uh, because of the, uh, I guess, growth in these, with these schools, uh, to add some extra layers of protection for the students in these schools, we just are adding some subcategories for gross tuition and the, the required bond amount for universities or, or colleges that have a gross tuition amount of above $1 million. It's really that simple, but if you guys have any questions, I am happy to answer questions. The kiss of death there, sir, calling it simple. Um, would you go back, you, you do have a question, but uh, would you go back and just art articulate Remember, we talked yesterday when the director, you and I met uh, on section one, um, these schools that were, were taking out from under the director is not true, you know, as we discussed, they're, they're looked in, looked, they're looked over by the Department of Defense, but they also provide educational services in, in, in some cases to non-military personnel, correct? That is correct. And the way that funding works is these schools are fu federally funded. And if they don't have people in those chairs, they don't get those funds. So let's say that, and again, we can get into exact numbers, but say there's 50 seats and, and they're only filling 45 of them. 
they would extend this offer to people from the public to fill those last five seats to ensure that the 45 military are able to get that education. And, and we, we talked about as part of that application since we would not be look, uh, overviewing them, the, 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 uh, the commission would not be looking into them that it is a part of the, ed, uh, as part of the application for the new applications, uh, we would make part of that to uh, make them aware, much like we, we heard a bill today about the, the notice, this is not a government document. Remember the, the bill? I passed it today. Yeah, Representative Weedar had that. We would have something in their application that when these students joined that they would make note that the post, uh, our, our certification process is not over, overviewing that. It's the uh, responsibility of the Department of Defense because we want students going there that are non-military to, to go in their eyes wide open of, of who their, um, I guess, accrediting bodies, that's probably not the, the correct verbiage, but uh, who would be directly responsible for the oversight. Yes, sir. So we're gonna make, make that known to the, the folks before they uh, take a class there. Number seven. First thank part. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so uh, thank you for the bill. I, I did have a few questions, if I may, um, just to get a better understanding sure. of uh, the intent and effect of this bill. Uh, so when we're removing, um, I'm on section one to begin with, but when we're removing military bases from the purview of the commission, can you just clarify what specific commission are we talking about and who is the executive director? Are we talking USG or... So the executive director is Kirk Shook sitting right here in the front mm -hmm. row. And this and it is for the non-public post-secondary education commission. Okay. That is the that is who would go in and and ensure that they're doing things the way we would want them done. Okay. And and the executive director falls under which agency or branch? The non am I missing I, I mean I, no, I'm not missing the question. It's the non-public post-secondary education commission and is that okay. under within that is under this or? as a state department okay that's an executive branch agency is it not sir okay uh, uh, and, and i was probably remiss and you did a great job um explaining the bill but um director do you want to give us a a, a two-minute uh refresher on on what you do and the, the, the give us a couple of examples i don't want to uh, i know these are competitive uh, educational institutions so i don't want to Pick at, pick at anyone or give them free advertisement per se, but if you could give us some examples of the types of uh, education uh, you oversee, that would just give us a, a, a bit of a refresher. Sure. Uh, well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for here here in our agency bill today. Uh, all of the, well, sections two through four were all passed by this committee last year uh, and made it out of rules, but then of course, with the end of the session coming so quickly and the, uh, the COVID situation, it didn't make it further than that. Uh, so section one is the only new part uh, that you haven't heard at this point. Uh, but our agency is an executive branch agency. It's a standalone agency. Um, I'm appointed by the governor and our agency regulates all the private colleges in the state. Uh, and that ranges from your uh, Emory's and Young Harris, of which I'm an alum, uh, to your for-profits that are accredited, uh, accredited, unaccredited, uh, everything from a mom and pop school to the large giant universities that you see advertised on, um, on the radio and the television. So that's what we do. Uh, specifically to section one, the question that was asked here was about the uh, military-based schools. Uh, uh, Representative Weedauer did a great job uh, talking about the uh, of what we do and what this bill's intent is. Um, you could have my job. Uh, you did did such a good job there, so uh, so I appreciate that. But um, uh, these schools, as uh, the representative said, are a mixture of there are some public schools uh, that are on basis. So like um, uh, Central Texas College, it's a state school in Texas, but they have a campus here in, um, or a couple campuses, I should say on a couple of our military terror bases. Uh, we have um, uh, nonprofit schools, for-profit schools. It's a mixture of who is on these bases, mm -hmm. but most of what they do, uh, and, and I'm, I'm reaching out to try to get all the numbers uh, as of yesterday after my meeting with the chairman, uh, but there's about 3,000 students that are served. Um, about 90 plus percent of them are military personnel who are active on the base. Uh, but as representative said, there are, they have to have a certain amount to be able to receive the Title IV funding from the feds and all those things. All of these institutions are accredited, I should say, ranging from SACS to the Higher Learning Commission, um, 
actually those are the only two accreditors uh, that accredit those uh, institutions, but they have to have a certain number of folks uh, in seats and about 10% are civilians coming from the surrounding areas, whether it's Hinesville or Columbus or wherever the base is. And so these are for all uh, military bases uh, ranging from Moody, uh, Gordon, uh, ben, Fort Benning, Fort Stewart, all of those. Uh, so that's that's what uh, this first section would cover. And it basically it would allow, th they would still be under our purview in the extent that they would be considered exempt because places like uh, Emory, Young Harris, those schools are exempt. These would be exempt as well. Um, that means they're exempt from the normal authorization process, which means that we would have to go on site visits, do a full application, paying all the fees associated with it, all of that. There's about 325 uh, schools that we currently regulate like that, and then about another 300 or so exempt schools that submit a smaller application, possibly a fee. We may do other things with it. But to, to the chairman's point, one of the things he asked for was uh, a disclaimer. Uh, we can do that. I checked with attorney, uh, general counsel. He said that we can do that within our agency policy and require that as, as far as the application process for these schools. So that is something that we can do. Uh, did I answer your question, Representative Park? Great. On that one. Did you have anything further to follow up on, Representative? I, I did, if I may. Please. Uh, so, if I can go to section two, uh, could you explain the reason for exempting section 12 and section 13 of that code section? Uh, yes, this was uh, before I uh, became director. I think this was back in 2015. There was a uh, change in our code section and um, subsection 12, which you'll see is crossed out here, uh, was paper sciences, paper science institutes when it first started. Well, it was found out that that is now housed on the campus of Georgia Tech. Uh, so that's not under our purview. So section 12 of that subsection uh, was taken out. And when uh, the legislature removed that, they completely removed uh, everything. And so that meant that everything below it moved up. So this uh, uh, change is essentially to bring this back to the original intent of the law of the schools that were under this will now be under this as, as they were intended to be back when the agency was first founded in the early 1990s. So this is a code section cleanup that was an oversight when they were first uh, making that uh, change to that code back, like I said, I think it's 2015. But basically, Representative Park, in, um, there, there is no um, paragraph 14. Mm -hmm. The period of 14 is, is now 13, and, and we're updating this to refer to that okay. proper language. Thank you. And um, section three, and, and I appreciate all the very helpful advice um, and clarification. Uh, why are we giving the executive director sole discretion to determine where an, an, an inspection would occur, if you may? Uh, right. So this uh, was especially important, as, as we saw with uh, COVID. Uh, but uh, from what we've been able to tell uh, with our agency that does uh, on-site inspections of physical facilities, we're about the only agency that we can tell that has, or are constrained by code that can only do a site visit physically, going out in person, seeing that facility. Uh, my wife and I, for example, are um, uh, trying to become foster parents. And so we had a home study visit and they did it virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this would give uh, me the authority and our agency the authority to be able to uh, save money uh, potentially, but also to be able to say, okay, if we have seen this, you know, Strayer campus that's, you know, accredited and, you know, uh, uh, very well run. Do we have to go see that every single year? Can we do it every other year? Just uh, to get, provide some flexibility in our, um, uh, in our agency. We have six staff members that um, go out across the state and visit all the 325 schools a year. Uh, and so it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, quite the load there. And so this could be a potential way for us to uh, save some taxpayer dollars, save some mileage on our agency vehicle and those things uh, to be able to look at possibly some accredited schools or some others to um, 
maybe visit every other year or some some schedule that we'll we'll come up with as a as a commission but that's to provide the flexibility to start that that i do not have at this point so while other agencies are able to go virtual like the 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 foster uh, care site visit we have not we've been going since june 15th and send sending our state uh, our staff out to all of these schools that uh, sometimes are not open themselves but we have to we have to visit to make sure they get authorized so Thank you. Just some flexibility. Mr. Chairman, uh, one final question, I promise. Thank you. So uh, going back, I'm sorry. <laughs> so going back to section one, just a, a question that popped up in my mind. If y'all are exempting military bases or, or educational facility, uh, facilities on military bases, does that in any way affect their accreditation? No, uh, for a school to be able to be accredited, they have to either be a, a private school, they have to either be authorized or exempt. So that's why Emory, for example, uh, can operate and get accredited and all of those things because they have an exemption from mm -hmm. us. Um, otherwise, you have to be authorized to get accreditation, those things. So no, this would not uh, affect that. They would just fall into a different category. They would still get a, a certificate instead of it saying a certificate authorization with my name on it. It'd be an annual certificate of exemption with my name on it. And that satisfies, at least to date, the, the feds and their, uh, uh, their requirements for what they, what they want. All right. well, well, thank you so much for, for all the clarification and your good service. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. You can. Okay. Um, I was hoping with all the questions that my colleague was answered that my question would be answered, but I'm not too sure. Um, could you sort of explain to me certain institutions operating on military installations? Kind of explain the certain institutions to me, because I have a follow-up question, and then who makes the decision about these certain institutions? Well, it is, uh, if a any institution operates in the state that is outside of the state, that is a private institution, they have to go through us. Mm -hmm. um, so currently, as the law currently stands, an institution, any institution, uh, you name it, uh, could operate on a military base and would not be subject to authorization, which is what I mentioned that we and our staff do on a daily basis, if they had just military personnel. So if they just enrolled the folks that are on the military base in their college, they would already be exempt uh, mm -hmm. uh, under our code as it currently stands. This uh, change in the language would expand this out to any of the campuses that operate solely on the military base. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, they are a mixture of state schools from other states, private schools, whatever, um, but they are all accredited uh, by an accreditor and they have oversight from the Department of Defense and they have a contract with them to operate on the base mm -hmm. and all of those things. So we're just an extra entity on the for these campuses. There's an extra expense on their side for maybe, and I, I got some of the numbers, some of them may have one student, four students, seven students, a very small amount out of their mm -hmm. total number of students, but they still have to seek authorization from us just because they're, they're enrolling civilians. Mm -hmm. uh, so e e no matter the amount, if it's even one student, it triggers them to have to come to us, go through the initial authorization process, pay the fees, have the site visit, all of those things. Whereas if they just didn't enroll that one student, they would be exempt. Anyways, okay, and correct. the reason for that question is because I was doing some research. It was another agency and they said certain institutions, all private and state institutions in the state of Georgia. And when I looked on the list, I didn't see my school in, I wondered why. And then the next question came to mind, who makes the determination about certain institutions? And I did further research, but we'll talk offline about that, okay? okay? Yeah. All right. I think in this case, the. The decision on military bases is driven entirely by the Department of Defense, right? They decide who can and cannot. Right. And, and then on a state-by-state -state basis, 
we decide how to do that. Right, and Thank the institution in. themselves, if they want to operate and can get a contract. Oh, well, certainly, things. yeah, they would have to be. Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'll go back to uh, Representative Weedauer. If I don't see any more questions here, I'm, I'm trying to get back to you. Do you see any on Zoom? Uh, okay, I believe you. I was just trying to get my Zoom screen back. Um, so I see no questions uh, for, for the director from Zoom. Uh, I, any questions for Representative Weedauer? Again, we are not taking action on this today. This is spread before the, the committee for review. We'll, uh, if, if you have a question today, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, Representative Weedow will try to answer it. Otherwise, if we have issues, we'll, we'll get with you uh, and we'll, we'll be back next week. Any questions for the gentleman? Uh, this is House Bill 152 LC 49037070S. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hang on. Just giving our Zoomers oh. the opportunity. I see no questions uh, here on Zoom, so we will uh, move on in our agenda this afternoon. And uh, I know you have a place you need to be. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M moving on in the agenda, uh, we have House Bill 7. House Bill 7. Representative Scott, are you ready to tell us about your proposition? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of this extinct committee. House Bill 7. House Bill 7 have been here many times before, and uh, we have made several corrections to House Bill 7. Last year it was House Bill 16. Well, House Bill 7 is intended to fill some of the gaps that make it difficult for former foster youth and homeless youth to afford a college education. Studies shows that about 80% of foster care youth hope to attend college, but only about 20% enrolled in college and less than 10% complete a two or four year degree by the time they're 26. While there are many factors that contribute to higher education gaps, advocates that agree <laughs> that limited access to financial aid is a leading cause. House Bill 16 is the result of the work of local coalition of stakeholders, community leaders, educators, and policy advisors working to identify and address the barriers to enrolling and paying for and completing post-secondary education. It builds on recent efforts by the state to provide support for our most vulnerable young adults, including the passage of House Bill 906, uh, last legislative session to extend foster care services to youth who turned 18 while they were in foster care. It is modeled after the Higher Education Access and Success for Homeless and Foster Youth Act that was currently pending in Congress and based on the recommendations from the United States Government Accountability Office. House Bill 16 does three things. It updates the Georgia Code to make sure that current and former foster youth, as well as homeless youth living in Georgia can qualify for in-state tuition in the university system and the technical college system. That's in sections two and four. It provides that once a student certifies that they are from a foster care or homeless situation, their status is maintained until they graduate, eliminating the need to recertify each year, which can be a very difficult process. That's also in section two and four. And it provides that in a foster care system, a student receives from the state would not be considered income for the purposes of determining fin financial need. That, uh, that is the um, gist of the bill, of House Bill 7. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, could you uh, help, help me, and, and this is just something I, I probably should be familiar with, but I'm going to let you... Um, um, help me out um, because I, it doesn't ring with me. On line 47, you refer to a new type uh, of degree, high set. Um, I'm not familiar with that. I, I, don't, I don't question it being in the bill. I, I actually, if, if the representative doesn't mind, I have a gentleman from TCSG that's going to come to our rescue, the two of us. To, would, would Representative Scott, would you yield to Mr. Bidding there to help, help us? 
Oh, help, okay. help the chair with the high. Oh, I was going to tell you what I said. Okay, that's fine. Well, if you got it covered. <laughs> oh, okay. You got it covered. You, you have the floor, ma'am. Yes, okay. Ma yeah, high said is, is nothing more than um, high school equivalency test, and which that is a test that has five sections to it, whereas the GED um, only has four tests. Uh, the high set is a test that you can take um, uh, with paper, a paper and pencil test, as well as with the computer. Thank you very much. That, that's awesome. I appreciate. It. I just wanted um, to. I, I thought it was similar to the GED. I just didn't know the ex exact definition. I thank you very much for educating the chair on that. Uh, would you stand for a question or two? Uh, yes, and I also have uh, Mr. Leckerling from the Barton Center here to answer any questions. Also, a absolutely. Well, you must have intimidated your question. I see one there. <laughs> you you had a question that went away, but uh, another one's back. Representative okay. uh, Park wants to. I asked you a question. I, I just wanted to say thank you again for bringing this bill. Um, you know, I, I think it addressed uh, one of my earlier concerns from last year. Um, again, thank you for being a good example of, of the perseverance needed to pass good legislation in this body. That's me. Uh, th thank you again for bringing this bill. Really appreciate it. Just to refresh our memory, and I believe we discussed it last time. Do we have any idea how many kids in Georgia are affected by this or would be? No, and, no. <laughs> just, I'm just curious. No, so no, I, I, I know I, I do not have the count, but um, I'm sure that we may be able to get it. From, do you have yeah. to, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative, we use that question up here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so data on how many students are exactly involved, especially on the homeless front, are notoriously difficult to determine. Um, what I can tell you is that every year it's estimated that about 45,000 Georgia children experience homelessness at some point. Um, so it's not an insignificant number. Um, and that's really what we're trying to address. So thank you. Thank you for, for that. I agree. One, one is too many, uh, but uh, that number. <laughs> Is something certainly we can act on. Do you have anything further, Representative? No, no, no. I'm, I was uh, for, the, for your question. Uh, no, I, I was going to. If she had a, a follow up question, uh, she does not. In any, uh, anyone else here have a question? Uh, any of the members of the committee? We do have some folks signed up to testify. So, uh, Reverend Scott, if you can hang with us in case you want to. I, again, we're going to hear this today and just make sure we, we get it right and, and we'll have you back next week. That would be the uh, chair's plan, but we'll move on at this time uh, to our testimony. Uh, Parker, um, is it Lackering? Leckerling. Lecker, Leckerling. <laughs> my, my apologies. I didn't want to be too familiar with the first name there, but it was easier for the chair. Not at, all. Not at all. Yes, sir. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, uh, as you heard Representative Scott say, uh, my name is Parker Leckerling. I'm the uh, new policy fellow at the Barton Child Law and Policy Center at Emory University. Um, this bill would be a really positive first step in expanding opportunities and access to higher education for Georgia's homeless and foster youth. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the COVID-19 COVID pandemic has really exposed so many of the systemic uh, inequities that communities experience all across Georgia every day. Um, and that's especially true in matters of education. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to say there's not a single Georgia student at any level that hasn't experienced some degree of academic disruption this year. Um, and for many of those students, those uh, disruptions have been fairly significant. Um, in challenging moments like this, I think it's, in, it's really important to remember that even at the best of times, um, there are a few populations at a greater risk of academic disturbance than uh, our homeless and our foster youth. Now, over the past few years, uh, Georgia has really made important progress in improving the high school graduation rate amongst its foster population. Um, DFAX has partnered with organizations like MAC uh, for uh, programs like LEADS here in Metro Atlanta. Um, and those, ha those have had a real measurable impact in the lives and academic success of the students involved. In spite of that success, uh, the high school graduation rate amongst uh, children in foster care continues to lag behind the overall student body population. Um, and we haven't seen any noticeable uptick in the um, enrollment or graduation rates amongst foster youth. And uh, for reasons I'm sure you can imagine, those numbers are even worse for our homeless populations um, who are subject to so many difficult circumstances that make it all the more challenging to graduate high school, let alone enroll in higher education. 
Now, an important component of these shortcomings is that for most of Georgia's 11,000 children in foster care and the estimated 45,000 that experience homelessness, um, higher education is simply an unattainable dream. Um, uh, as Representative Scott said, according to the Legal Center for Foster Care and Education, 84% of foster youths aged 17 to 18 um, hope to attend college. Um, but just a slight clarification, it's only 20% of those who graduate that actually go on to attend college. So it's a subset of a subset. Um, uh, with little in the way of domestic or financial stability, those chil these children have little reason to seriously plan for higher education. Um, and as a direct result, consider their secondary education in high school as anything more than a state mandated chore. Um, as in all things, um, cost is a critical factor for these students. Um, allowing these students um, a, an easier pathway uh, to attending schools in the university system of Georgia and the technical college system of Georgia for the same in-state tuition rates that their peers pay, their peers pay excuse me, um, will help shrink the financial hurdle that higher education otherwise poses to them. Lowering barriers and expanding opportunities in higher education for Georgia's homeless and foster youth also represents an investment opportunity for the state. Um, homeless and foster youth are statistically more likely to end up unemployed, incarcerated, or otherwise dependent on public assistance. Completing high school significantly reduces rates of all three. And uh, any completion of a higher education program further compounds those gains. Um, what's more, by encouraging these students to broaden their education with college or technical school, you're allowing them to participate and contribute to the Georgia economy moving forward. So giving these children a more concrete academic path forward not only benefits them, but it also benefits the state. Lastly, HB7 would bring Georgia closer in line with other similarly situated states regarding higher education opportunities for foster youth. Currently, 35 states offer some type of state level tuition assistance for former foster youth. Um, our code section 20-3-660 um, um, went into effect on July 2009, um, and it was meant to be a series of grants to help foster children cover tuition, uh, housing, and associated fees. Um, but that uh, code section has never been appropriated. Um, so the, it's on the books, it's there, but uh, no money has ever been furnished for it. So those, um, those uh, foster children are still having to rely on federal chafee funds um, to be their primary source of funding for higher education. Some states use systems of grants like ours, um, but the more, uh, the more common and more popular option is uh, for what are called tuition waivers, which uh, do exactly what they say. They waive tuition and associated fees um, for eligible students. Um, and I actually think that the Senate is considering a tuition waiver bill for foster youth this session, um, SB 107. It might actually be, I actually think it's one of the Lieutenant Governor's bills. Um, um, either way, uh, uh, HB 7 uh, would go a long way towards um, expanding opportunities and lowering the, gap, the opportunity gap that uh, homeless and foster children currently face uh, in here in Georgia. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have one. Sure. Uh, Part. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. So currently under Georgia law, uh, foster students and, and homeless students have no current ability to access in-state tuition. Is that correct? So that's uh, they can still qualify. There, uh, there are currently three statuses that, uh, um, that any student applying to a high, an institution of higher education can qualify for. So you can be a dependent, an independent, or emancipated. Um, and then it, your, your uh, eligibility for in-state tuition is based on where your physical address is. Um, what this does is um, for a variety of reasons, um, homeless and foster youth have a hard time demonstrating that they have a physical Georgia address. Um, and so this just gives them an alternative avenue to qualify for in-state tuition, um, as opposed to making them jump through hoops, um, which their, uh, their academic peers otherwise don't have to. Thank you. Yeah, no further questions. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Chairman. If you would um, let Ms. George, if you can stay till the, the meeting concludes, make sure we know how to, to reach you if you of don't course. mind. Uh, I'm sure uh, Representative Scott knows how to, to reach you, but we'd, uh, we'd like to make sure as if, if there are any um, uh, improvements, any tweaks we make to the bill, we wanna make sure we, we don't get away from the main, main question. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you very much. Chairman. All right, I'm gonna go at this time, right? I'm going to go at this time to, we have some folks signed up uh, in, in uh, Zoom land. And, and one thing that uh, Chair should have mentioned earlier, if you're testifying via Zoom, um, you're welcome to, but not required. Your testimony will not uh, be taken any less seriously if uh, you choose to Zoom with us verbally and not Zoom with us 
um, with your camera on. Uh, everybody knows that uh, um, you, we, we hope you're not zooming and driving. I will just, I will add to that. But other, other than that, uh, we're, we're interested in hearing what you're having to say. So I just had a question about, do I have to turn my camera on or, or not by, by some folks? And, and of course you do not. Um, we're, we're interested uh, in, in having your comments. So with that, I think what we have to do here is just call on you and you have to unmute yourself. Uh, Ms. McLean. Hello, my name is Leslie. I am a 22 year old student at Dalton State. I'm a senior um, in interdisciplinary studies with a concentration in child welfare and public policy and a minor in communications and English. Um, this bill would be incredible. It would allow not only myself in my last year of school, but students who are currently coming into the into the higher education field um, and youth who have the passion to want to go to school. It would allow them to have that financial ability to be able to go to school the same way as their their peer and fellow student counterparts. Um, unfortunately, we are given different circumstances growing up. We we wind up in a system that many people aren't really familiar with um, unless you are in the system yourself. We we talk about these statistics that we want us to be, whether it be as a, as a female like teen pregnancy or incarceration or homelessness, um, but we aren't given the same opportunities as someone who is not in the system. And so this bill would allow more assistance and less less um, financial financial stress for my education. I'll be able to focus more on my studies and work harder to beat those statistics, but also set an example for those who are coming into care um, or into the higher education that they they have the opportunity to really just focus on their education. They don't need to be worrying about, well, can I pay for my schooling? Um, am I going to be able to finish my schooling? Because the worst feeling is to be halfway through your, your education and worry if, if funding is gonna be cut or, or if someone's gonna be able to be there and support us through the last little bit of our education. So this will give me and a bunch of other students the ability to reach their goals um, with the same chance and opportunities as our student counterparts. Thank you very much. Um, I, I see no questions, uh, Ms. McLean, but I, I thank you for uh, providing your information to us today. And if you uh, are inclined, uh, I, I would encourage you email our, our office. Um, you can look us up online. Um, or chuck.martin at legis.ga.gov so that we can keep you uh, in the loop and keep you aware of meetings in the future. <clears throat> I'll make that offer to all of uh, uh, those that are listening and testifying. Please let us know how we can reach you if, if you're so inclined so that we can keep you looped in. Um, no, no questions. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Also, the chair would like to recognize, I think we've had two members that may have joined uh, quite a, a, a bit of time ago uh as chairman perkle chairman clay perkle and uh, representative dr jasmine clark have joined us on video that uh, have been here for for quite some time i don't know i, I gave miss mclean a heads up about uh, who was coming next but um it's hard to keep up with typing in the chat box here uh, miss kelly if you're ready um unmute and you have the floor okay hi everybody Right, so I'm Jamie Kelly. Um, I'm, a, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I was saying we hear you. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. You're, you have oh, the so Okay. So um, I'm Jamie Kelly. I just graduated from Georgia Burnett College in Human Development and Agent Services. I'm planning to go get my master's this fall. And one of the schools is Georgetown, which I'm planning to major in gerontology. But um, this bill would definitely help a lot. Um, I know through college, my biggest fear before I went to college and before I decided to stay in care was like, how am I gonna pay for school? Yes, I applied scholarships and everything. It is like the financial aspect of it. It was like my biggest concern. I knew I was gonna ace college and everything, but I just didn't wanna worry and be um, thinking about, okay, I gotta pay for this, gotta pay for that. Cause one time my, um, it was, they dropped my classes one semester because payment wasn't 
validated or it wasn't sent in and I got really nervous and scared. So I started calling around, just making sure everything's okay. And it was, it's that worrying, like, okay, I'm over here trying to focus on my studies. I just don't want to worry about the financial aspect of it. You know, in a sense, I just want to make sure everything's together. If I, if y'all need anything, I would grab any paperwork I need, but it's like, just knowing like, okay, I have to pay for school. I got to make sure everything's together before this happened again. Cause I didn't want that to happen again where the point that my classes got dropped in the midst of college, you know? So this bill definitely gonna help a lot, especially youth who in care and youth who age not of care, as well as youth who trying to go to their second degree, what third degree, which I'm planning to get my master's. And this would definitely help a lot for me and other um, students as well. Ms. Kelly, thank you very much. And uh, again, same offer, if you would like to stay in contact with us, please e email our office and uh, we'll keep you in the loop on how the bill progresses. Progressive. Progressive. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm going to go now to uh, Keaton. That's what I see on the screen here. I'm not the uh, last name. Are you with us? Um, yes, sir. Yes, nice sir. You have the floor. Okay. My name is Keaton Lundy, and currently I'm a junior at Augusta University. I'm getting my bachelor's degree in history and a minor in sociology. Um, and this bill will be very, very helpful, helpful for foster youth and also homeless people as well because um, college is very, very, very expensive. And unfortunately, some, we don't always have the, um, you know, the privilege and the basic necessities to always um, get through that because how the way some of these institutions calculate finances, because um, personally I had that happen to me. Um, this happened to me a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't get um, another loan to help finish like pay for books and like my meal plan because they the way how the system calculate um certain things they counted like the um assistance that I've received from the state so it'll be very beneficial to you know a lot of um, students coming in and it'll be very encouraging it it'll be very encouraging too. Thank you, sir. Well, it's that same offer to you. Please uh, email us if you so choose, so we can keep you in the the loop here. The next person we have uh, to speak. Uh, Miss Hudson, Sarah Hudson. There you are. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great to be with y'all. Uh, my name is Sarah Bess Hudson, and I serve in support of youth engagement um, in our state by way of Georgia Empowerment um, with other members of our team. Um, so I just wanted to say hi, and I'm going to uh, yield to uh, Sando, who will uh, round out the testimony today. Um, but thank you so much. It's great to be with y'all. Are, are, are you guys together or? Okay, I see somebody else unmuted. There you go. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Zukapuzi. I am a, a former foster youth um, and I'm also a, a young father. Um, I'm an uh, aspiring social entrepreneur, uh, uh, aspiring youth life coach, and I am affiliated with MAC um, and Annie E. Casey Foundation. I'm on a couple boards from, for them to uh, help with everything that deals with uh, young parents and just youth in general with um, you know housing, school, and everything. Um, but this bill would be good for me because I too actually was able to uh, attend college in 2018, but I was not able to finish my uh, entire semester because at the time I was in care and um, there was some funding issues and I was not able to uh, finish school and that was very disappointing for me. So now with, with everything, you know, for all the different groups I'm affiliated with, I am trying to, you know, get a professional background um, in education to myself now, um, to my name. So this bill will be very good because it, it, it will alleviate a lot of the stress, the stressors that I felt for myself personally going through uh, the whole process, you know, trying to focus on how I'm going to, how I'm going to finish the next semester, as well as how I'm going to take care of my, uh, my child and um, myself also. So I was, I was too focused on too many things um, and I was not able to finish school at the time. So I feel like a bill like this will help not only myself, but also a lot of people like myself. Thank you very much. I, I think you may have a question. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? If the gentleman would, would take a question, we have one from the, the, the member of the committee. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, actually, it wasn't for him. I wanted okay. to know if the young man from uh, Augusta College, if he was able to resolve his issue. He said that he didn't get his meal plan and he couldn't buy his books, I think. Okay, Let, let's, um, let me see if we can get him back online. Um, I, I thank all the speakers for um, um, their offering their, their testimony. We, we did have a question. I, I guess that was... Uh, Keaton, is that right from from Augusta? Are you still with us? Do you, can you did you hear oh. the question from the representative? Were you able to get your issues resolved and and still able to uh, finish up school? Yeah. Um, yes, sir. I, I was able um to get it resolved. Um, I was able to get help from Miss Um Sarah Vest for like food and things like that. And I'm also in the um Army Reserves. But the only kind of negative thing about that we sometimes we don't always get paid on time. And I don't know like why that happens, but I was able to get it um figured out. But I think that's why I was that's why I wanted to give that testimony because you know everybody don't choose to to um you know serve the country. And so if I wasn't in the reserves, you know nine times out of ten I probably wouldn't wouldn't have been able to get that um situated. So yes, thank you very much. Sorry you had trouble with that, and thank you for your service. Um, that, thank you, you know, too. That's, that, that's just another thing that. You know, being in the reserves, um, I, I have not served myself, but I know a number of people that have. Um, that there's more to it today than there's ever been before. Uh, to being the, the the I believe the the statement they used to use a weekend a month and uh, you know several weeks a year, and and that you're you're called on uh, in in the uh, defense of our country and service to our country now so much more in the reserves than than you were in years past. So thank you for your service. Glad that worked out. And um, committee, that uh, completes our online um, testimony at this time. I, I'm going to open it back up to the committee and go to Ms. Scott, but if, if the committee would just give me a, a moment here, uh, privilege. We, we've heard a couple of things today relative to this bill that, that are directly this bill. We've heard some testimony, I believe, um, indirectly that, that uh, maybe talks to us about some other opportunities that we have and, and we, we are going to work on, if not this session, if, if um, the health of the nation um, in, in terms of COVID allows us to get out when we uh, left here um, last year. Uh, but, you know, at the break, we, we had hoped we would be able to, to do some things in the summer and see some institutions. I know uh, the secretary of the committee, uh, Representative Bentley, wanted us to get down to Fort LaValle State and, and do a tour and get out. I say all that to say this, we've heard just the, the gentleman's issue with the, you know, the dollars to finish the, finish the drill, if you will, or, or finish the swim. Um, I don't know if we'll get to that this session, but that is uh, a focus that I want to have uh, over the interim, uh, getting out, talking to our, our campuses, uh, both in the technical college system and in the university system. Um, we have too many people that just get almost across I, I use the analogy of, of the, the English Channel. If you're swimming, you know, swimming from England to France, it, it doesn't matter um, if you don't make it. It doesn't matter if you uh, sink ten yards from shore or ten miles. If you sink, you sink, and you don't finish. And so, to, to our students that are struggling to finish that last mile, that last ten yards of the swim, um, Georgia State University does a great job with the Panther Grant. And we're going to get them in here before the um, uh, end of the session if, if we're able to time-wise and talk about how they do that and, and how we might work with our institutions um, to provide more of that. I think there are some other – I saw, Neil, uh, Mr. Betty, I'm not putting you on the spot, but I, I think you have some things at the technical college system um, that, that help people uh, fi finish the drill, so to speak. So we heard a little bit about that. Great testimony on, on the, the representative's uh, bill. Uh, but we also heard some other things about how we can help finish um, the opportunity. I mean, these, these are opportunity students, opportunities you know, for the universities and the technical college system to, to help people finish the drill. And, and that provides a great opportunity uh, for our state to get better. And so uh, thank you for allowing me that latitude. But I would really like us to, to concentrate on that, as, as, if not during this session in our, in our interim. With that, I see no questions, uh, additional questions for the speakers. I thank them. For, for being with us. Um, thankful for the, the, the technology that uh, 
we've implemented. I, I, I won't call COVID at all a blessing, but it has allowed us to uh, get testimony that you might, you all might not have been able to, to get down here in person. And, and we're blessed to, to have that. Reverend Scott, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to, uh, if you want to wind up everything, but I, I think we have a positive, uh, you know, indication again on your bill, we just, I'd like to sit with you in the, the before we get next Wednesday and just make sure we have all the the I's dotted and the T's crossed, if you will, just commas and references so that when we get it up to um, uh, presuming the committee moves it forward, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I, I think you, you have a good uh, opportunity that we move this forward, that, that we have it exactly right. So we don't uh, lose anything with a with a technicality. With that, did you have anything you wanted to offer to the committee as we're winding up today? The committee and thank you all because, like I said, that uh, it's been a long journey, and I'm really hoping that uh, it will make it through uh, this year so that we can be of service to our kids that are trying to go to college and finish uh, because that will mean so much to them because as we know, these are kids that don't have a place. Uh, a lot of them living in foster care and a lot of them are homeless. And this was definitely be able to support them so that they can become productive citizens of, of this world and be hopefully stay in Georgia and be able to work, grow and raise a family. So again, I would just like to say thank you all again for hearing House Bill 7. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you for bringing it. And we look forward to being in touch with you and, and getting you back up here, here very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have any further business, but I, I want to thank you again. Uh, we touched base um, when we first put this committee together, or I was uh, first able to uh, chair this committee a couple of years ago, that we have an opportunity not just to change things, but change things that change things uh, and have a mul multiplier effect. Um, and you guys, uh, I really appreciate it. I know that you have a lot of places to be this afternoon and uh, you, you came here uh, to, to our committee for this hearing and I appreciate that. Thank you to all that, that came in the audience. Thank you to all the people that testified. If there are no uh, further business before the committee will stand adjourned. There are no, no objection, we'll stand adjourned. I see none and we are adjourned.